it's bold head, head. viewers. Uh, welcome on this uh, lovely day, or at least lovely where I am. Uh, I am Dr. Robert Farley of the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Um, and with me today is Justin Logan, who is the Director of Foreign Policy Studies at Cato. This is Justin's very first blogging event. This is your first, right? It is indeed. Yeah, yeah. Justin's very first blogging event, so please give him um, in comments or whatever, a uh, you know a, a very uh, happy welcome to blogging heads. Um, should remind everyone who is a fan of foreign entanglements that uh, if you want to receive regular or semi-regular updates um, about foreign entanglements, uh, which we'll you know we'll maybe post stuff about uh, some of the conversations we have, but we'll also uh, post the conversations themselves. Then we can be liked on Facebook. It's only the click of one button. Um, like. Even if you don't like us, you can still uh, click the like button and you'll get information from us. Um, so, uh, how is your, uh, I, I usually start these off by asking about the weather. Uh, how is your weather up there in, uh, in uh, where you are? Uh, it's nice here. Uh, global warming appears to be treating us well. Uh, we've had a pretty balmy winter and it's now, I'd say, in the 50s and sunny. So, uh, yeah, we're quite pleased with it. My attitude is if it's cold, it should be snowing, and if it's not snowing, it shouldn't be cold. Um, right. So we're in the latter category. Right. It's 60 here today, and it's been 60 for, seems like, half of February, um, which is unusual for Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and I think we got an inch and a half or snow, of snow or something uh, along those lines for the entirety of the winter, um, which is just shocking. But I'm not going to draw any any empirical conclusions about just how nice this winter has been. Um, so we're here to talk about foreign policy. Um, and by the time that almost all of you watch this, we will know more about the state of the 2012 uh, presidential race. We'll know, I mean, everybody sort of knows that Mitt's going to win um, Arizona, but the question is who will win, whether it's going to be Mitt or um, Rick Santorum, who will win in Michigan, um, and apparently it's an extremely tight race. Um, but uh, recently in foreign policy, um, Carl Rove, and I think he had one co Ed Gillespie was the co-author, co um, argued a um, conclusion that a lot of people really kind of found surprising. Um, uh, people, or most people seem to agree that um, however much we may agree or disagree with the substance of Barack Obama's foreign policy, that he will not be particularly vulnerable on foreign policy during this election, that foreign policy will probably be a strength, um, whether we you know, talk about it in terms of withdrawing from Iraq or we talk about it in terms of um, the bin Laden killing or whatever. Um, but Rove and Gillespie argued uh, quite the opposite, that in fact um, a, a good Republican candidate can um, can run a uh, foreign policy campaign against um, Barack Obama. Um, now, I, I guess, what is what? Do you think that's a fair characterization of the article? Um, and what do you think of that of that thesis? I thought it was a wildly silly piece on two main levels. I mean, there's two ways of, mm -hmm. of getting at the thesis of the piece. The first is that you know everyone thinks that the election is going to be about jobs and the economy and the deficit, et cetera. That's the conventional wisdom, and we're here to tell you, Carl Rove and Ed Gillespie, that the conventional wisdom is wrong. So that's the first piece: is that the salience issue in political science jargon that foreign policy is and will be uh, salient in the election. And the second piece is that, insofar as foreign policy is salient. Uh, Obama is vulnerable to attack the sort of decades-old uh, Republican attack on democratic foreign policy that it's weak, it's un-American, it's not strong and masculine enough, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what I really thought was terrible about the piece is that they only had one piece of data um, in the piece, which was a poll that said uh, it, it, it asked voters what they thought the state of America was compared to when President Obama was elected. And the piece of evidence that they use from that poll is that 50 percent of voters say that uh, America's standing in the world is worse off than it was when President Obama was elected. And I forget what the number who said our standing in the world is better off than what President Obama was. It, it was a significant difference. It was like a 20 percent difference. It was. So it wasn't trivial, but right. the question may have been trivial. but. 
the interesting thing, though, is that the sort of the public zeitgeist uh, clicked through and looked at the poll. It's from Resurgent Republic, which I, was not an organization that I was familiar with. Um, but it, it, unsurprisingly, at least to me, the public is very cool on just about everything. It's cool on the economy. It's cool on the deficit. But so in the piece, they argue, and I'll quote here, um, they say that uh, uh, the, the struggle that will define the arc of the 21st century is the fight against terrorism. And they make the sort of, uh, uh, what I think for lack of a better term, could be called the Peter Fever lament that Obama doesn't mm -hmm. talk about victory enough. You need to say victory, victory. That's what's important. Um, and in the poll that they use to talk about standing in the world, 39% um, of respondents say that the United States is safer from terrorism than when Obama took office, and 20% say that we're less safe from terrorism than when Obama took office. So I'm open to being persuaded that Obama's vulnerable on foreign policy, but this article did very little to prove the case. Right. Uh, there, there were a bunch of in very interesting things about it, and, and we can talk a little bit about motive, because when, I mean, when Karl Rove writes something, you know that he's not writing with the idea of empirical accuracy in mind, right? I mean, he's writing for effect. Um, and so, you know, who exactly is the expected audience of this? But, you know, I, I, I guess I found this article to be so um, out of sorts because in, in the few, and I have not watched very many, not a high percentage or not a high absolute number, of the dozens and dozens of Republican debates that have happened in this cycle. Um, but you know, sort of even my cursory glance is that when Ron Paul will go off and, and say, um, you know, make a set of uh, you know almost neo isolationist claims, that th these often get applause lines from the GOP audience, um, not always, but often. And you know, I think that um, even sort of similar sort of claims that come from the other candidates also seem to find resonance. So, you know, claims that are not associated with this, um, Barack Obama is insufficiently aggressive, Barack Obama is insufficiently hawkish, um, we have an insufficiently militaristic foreign policy, and we apologize for America all the time. That doesn't really seem to resonate even that well with Republican voters in this cycle. Um, I don't know, Wayne, what is, do you, do you have a sense of that, or? I think that the Republicans are caught between two opposing impulses, both of which would like to be persuaded or portrayed portrayed as conservative, right? So, so far, the the impetus has been uh, Obama is sort of a woolly-headed Wilsonian, right? He's he's going out into the world singing kumbaya, uh, the apology tour business. He's sort of un-American, and all of this I think veers, in some cases, uncomfortably close to the sort of birther Obama is a Muslim. Uh, right. sort of conspiracy theories. And weirdly, I think, insofar as the Rove Gillespie piece hints at these more abstract, inchoate criticisms of Obama as being sort of uncomfortable with American power. I mean, they, they, they explicitly say that the Republican candidate should be nationalistic, which normally the euphemism for American nationalism is American Patriotic. exceptionalism or patriotism, right? And they don't even, you know, go to the trouble to, to perfume the pig, so to speak. But I think that might actually have some traction, right? If they can, without directly going certainly down the birther route or what have you, but if they can right. just sort of drop hints that he's not one of us, you know, President Obama just seems uncomfortable with our people, um, to use a sort of Pat Buchanan type political phrase. That sort of appeal, I think, may have traction. Again, they don't marshal any evidence to, to believe that's true. And it bears saying that, you know, what might work in the primary to get people to like you, that, you, you know, you're viscerally opposed to President Obama, may boomerang and backfire on you in the general election where people feel like you're impugning right. the president's patriotism. Right, right. Um, Right. I mean, and, and so what you're saying is that it has a, and we use this phrase a lot, but a sort of a dog whistle character, um, which will strike a certain audience in a certain way um, and push them in a direction away from the president, which I, I, you know, I guess makes sense. But I mean, so it, well, I guess here we come to my next question about this. If this piece had been by, you know, random, random person X, um, who, you know, just sort of made this argument, um, 
first it probably wouldn't have been an FP, but it would have gone down the memory hole pretty quickly. Um, so Rove and Gillespie wrote this, or at least put their names on it. Um, but is, are, are they making an argument here, or are they trying to make an argument here to Mitt and Rick, presumably, presumably more Mitt than Rick, um, that you know, this is really worth going after? And it seems that it seems that Mitt is at least open to launching a foreign policy. I mean, he has made a lot of his critiques of Obama have been on foreign policy. Um, and so it seems that Mitt is at least open to the idea of launching a foreign policy-based attack um, on Obama, and perhaps even Santorum, too. Um, or you know, is it a, is it a message to other people, sort of within the the GOP campaign hierarchy, that this is something to be taken seriously, that this is a constituency that we need to address? Or and ends up, you know, I even kind of read it as, <laughs> is this an article intended for Democrats just to get them worried, right? Just the, just sort of to furrow their brows um, about what they thought was a strength, and so maybe to to suggest to them that they shouldn't push as hard on the idea of foreign policy being a strength, and they should sort of be more willing to take a more traditional democratic role on foreign policy, which is sort of a defensive role, right? Saying, well, no, I am is just as tough as the other guy, um, rather than sort of taking a very um, forthright defense of the Obama foreign policy record, however you may feel about it. I mean, did, did you have any thoughts on that? Or I mean, it was a weird piece. I've, I've made probably pretty clear that I thought it was a dumb piece. But it bears remembering that Karl Rove's ideas about how Republicans could and should use foreign policy to political advantage brought a disaster on the Republican Party mm -hmm. in 2006 and in 2008. And there's really been, I think, very little reckoning uh, in the Republican Party about the implications of what I think were just a disastrous decade, uh, uh, or almost decade, of policies under President George W. Bush. So it, far be it for me to sort of peer into Karl Rove's soul to figure out, uh, you know, what it is he, exactly he's trying to do with this piece. It might just have been a, a, a boneheaded argument that he thought was true. Um, but right, just to, right. to sort of bring it back to the piece about, you know, the GOP being riven by conflicting impulses on the one hand to call Obama a hippie peacenik and on the other hand I, 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 you know that you mentioned the Ron Paul business there's the story out uh, I guess today that Newt Gingrich uh, has said uh, with respect to the campaign in Afghanistan that uh, the Afghans are going to have to figure out quote how to live your own miserable life because you clearly yeah. don't want to learn from America how to be unmiserable um, and so this is the sort of, again, that's nationalistic. If you want nationalism, right. that's a particular sort of nationalism. And I think that's the sort of Jesse Helms nationalism that we saw in the Republican Party in the 1990s, right? So there are two schools of conservative nationalism. And, and one says the world is irretrievably flawed, America is good, and the greater America is involved in the irretrievably flawed world, uh, the worse America will become. America will, in a sense, be contaminated by this perennial involvement with, uh, uh, you know, and at the founding it was the balance of power in Europe that was the great uh, 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 fear. So that's the one school, the sort of contamination school of American nationalism. The other school of American nationalism says America is great, the world is flawed, and therefore we have to make the world like America. And that's what I think you would call the neoconservative iteration of conservative nationalism. And these two impulses are really in conflict. And I think what you've seen, as you pointed out, the candidates are sort of flailing around trying to get handle, get a handle on both of them because they're not sure which is going to be uh, the future uh, uh, I inside the GOP. So I think there's a real shakiness there. Right. And there's even, I mean, there's even a fair amount of strategic interaction within the campaign, right? Because, I mean, Newt has really gone back and forth um, on between these. Two. I think that Newt has, Newt has tacked between these two groups, right? He's never sort of consistently been a neocon, but he's never sort of either consistently been um, a nationalist. I mean, you know, maybe a little more on the nationalist side than the neocon, but you know, he was he was a, he was really a cold warrior as well. Um, but you can definitely see an incentive for for him now to sort of take this line, right? I mean, he has to take a high risk, high reward gamble at this point to have any hope. And it's going forward, it'll be really interesting how, if the race continues to be interesting, so if Centaur wins tonight in Michigan, or at least does very well in Michigan tonight, how 
the, the, the major remaining candidates will try then through their flailing or whether one of them will sort of you know figure out a way um, to either find a seam in which they can exploit one of these or the other or where they, they can find a way to straddle. Um, I mean it's also interesting I think that um, there are a lot of people in the GOP who really do understand that foreign policy was a disaster in 2006 and 2008 and we had a little bit of a kerfuffle here in Kentucky I don't know a few months ago when some document came out that that made clear that Mitch McConnell had had sort of very strongly advised President Bush to start some sort of withdrawal, to fire Donald Rumsfeld, um, and to do any other number of things in uh, 2005 and 2006 because McConnell quite rightly understood that the, the Republicans were going to be crushed in 2006 um, if, if they didn't do something with regards to Iraq. Um, and so certainly there are large and powerful and influential elements within the GOP who understand the electoral disastrousness of that decade of foreign policy. Um, but it's not so much the fever part, it's not so much obviously the rove part, um, or sort of more broadly, I guess, the elements associated with uh, neoconservatives in the Bush administration. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, all right, well, well, go ahead. No, I just, I was agreeing with you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, let's tack, let, let's take that last bit about what Newt has said about Afghanistan, and let's um, move over and talk a little bit about um, the burning of the Qurans and Obama's apology and so forth and how that's played out. I mean, I, th I thought it was very interesting yesterday that your ex was really fumbling in terms of trying to, uh, to explain I mean, he was trying to use the rhetoric of the apology tour, but at the same time, he couldn't help but admit that it was a mistake, <laughs> right? that it was a mistake to have burned these Qurans, right? And, you know, however um, much of an overaction there may have been from the Afghans, it was surely a mistake on the part uh, of the United States, but a mistake, I think he characterized it, that we shouldn't apologize for, um, because that would be apology tour. Um, but it's interesting how that is the, and, and it's interesting that Obama came out and then made you know, a relatively clear apology, even um, under appreciating that this was going to be uh, an attack line for uh, either Santorum or Mitt Romney in the general election. And so, in that sense, it was um, there was a certain tension between electoral incentive and uh, what was, from my point of view, obvious good policy in terms of what he said for the, the Afghans. Yeah, I mean, I think that Romney, actually, I'm, I'm not uh, somebody who, who votes or does anything like that. I live in the district, uh, so that's an argument for not voting, and I, I, I think it's probably a waste of time to vote regardless because the marginal chances of your vote affecting an election are almost asymptotically approaching zero. But get it with that out of the way. Well, thank, thank goodness, then, that, this, that nobody in Michigan or, or Arizona is going to hear this sure. before the election. Because sure. Because we wouldn't want to ruin them. Well, it's, it's probably clo less close to zero for them than it is for me. Um, but it, with that said, I mean, I think Romney tried to have this in the middle way. He had some formulation about the apology to the Afghans where he said, you know, sort of it sticks in our throat. You know, we, we it, it, it doesn't feel good. And I think that's how most people feel, right? They don't like apologizing to foreigners. Um, but he didn't go all in and say, you know, Obama's bowing down to the great unwashed Muslim masses or what have you. And I think there's a good reason for that, which is that, you know, the GOP has spent a long time fetishizing and, and reifying and deifying, really, counterinsurgency uh, as the way, you know, uh, on the shoulders of St. General David Petraeus, um, you know, America has restored its promise and mission, blah, 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 in the world. And if you want to be in the counterinsurgency game, and you happen by, by you know, uh, uh, accident or on purpose to have set alight the sacred book, in the country in which you're trying to perform counterinsurgency on the part of a third party government, you probably ought to apologize. And I think if the GOP went all in on this criticism, it would be extremely easy for Obama to wheel out, if not Petraeus himself, any, no um, any number of other high ranking coindonistas to say, look, you know, if you want to be in Afghanistan, you can't just go around burning Qurans and saying, 
you know, if you don't like that tough beans. I mean, it's just, so I think the, it, it does stick in America's craw to apologize for things. I mean, Americans don't like that. So Romney, I think, mm -hmm. probably played it about right. Right. No, and I hadn't seen I hadn't seen Romney's um, Romney's comments specifically. I mean, it's also interesting that going forward, um, you know, Romney himself will have a, a considerable degree of freedom in what in 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 sort of positioning himself. You know, after the Republican uh, primary is over, he'll have some freedom in terms of positioning himself as a moderate. Um, while at the same time, there will be voices who will sort of make more aggressive claims. Um, with regards to um, what the apology means and why the apology was problematic for the United States and so forth, and I mean that's true of every of every candidate and their relationship with um, actors which are outside the campaign. I mean, it is interesting that I, I mean Romney has assembled, I think, a very professional, very experienced, um, very professional and very experienced with also a. Um, very certain point of view on international politics, but nevertheless a very professional, very experienced um, foreign policy team. And so you would also be able to see that even within that team there might be some reluctance to um, to in engage in a full-throated denunciation of what is at least a quasi-sensible policy on, on the part of the president. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a side discussion. I'm very, very cool uh, on the Romney foreign policy team and more broadly on the GOP foreign policy establishment. Um, I wrote a piece at uh, our blog at the National Interest magazine um, basically lamenting the fact that if you sort of went back and said, look, say Mitt Romney was a sort of Brent Scowcroft realist, right? He was sort of in the, the George H.W. Bush mold. Um, who would he have staffed his national security team with had he wanted to do that? And it's very, very difficult to come up with a list of a dozen or two dozen names of people under 65 who are from that mold. And I think there's really been an enervation of the more or less sensible wing of the GOP foreign policy establishment in favor of people who may or may not describe themselves as neoconservatives, but I certainly would lump into that right. camp. So th there's just nothing uh, to go on. Uh, the, you know, the neoconservatives have really done a good job of co-opting and, in a sense, inheriting uh, the GOP foreign policy establishment. So that's a little bit sort of off topic, but I'm very, very disappointed. No, I mean, I, I, I think I think that's I, I think that's right on topic, and I think it's 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 uh, really very interesting because uh, you know broadly speaking, I agree. Yeah, when I when I suggested that that I mean his advisors were experienced and credentialed and so forth. This is experienced and credentialed in the terms of the GOP foreign policy establishment, the the, the terms that that um, the establishment now uses. But I mean, I think it's it's absolutely correct that um, there there just aren't that many people to draw on who aren't in some way affiliated or at least comfortable with that particular point of view on foreign policy, with with you know the point of view that's broadly associated with neoconservatism, that's associated with the Bush administration, and so forth. And that's true even as we don't have a consensus within the extant in power GOP about foreign policy, right? You don't have a consensus on foreign policy within the GOP, but the GOP foreign policy establishment operates completely by consensus, right? There, there, there isn't much um, difference of opinion within that um, establishment. No, that's quite which, right. You know, but one of my old suggest. Go ahead. One of my old professors used to say that the Wall Street Journal op-ed page is like Pravda on foreign policy, and I think that could be said about the GOP foreign policy establishment as a whole. Right, right. I mean, it's it's very centered around heritage, very centered around AEI. Um, it's uh, and this is going to sound bad, and it, it is bad, but it's not as bad as it sounds. It's very incestuous in terms of um, all the people knowing each other and all the people um, having the same sorts of relationships with a few powerful figures. I mean, it, it's a very interesting network analysis. I think of um, this whole group that constitutes the the um, um, GOP establishment. Oh yeah. So let's 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 take this and then jump over to um, because presumably over the next four years, Obama is wanting to redirect the focus towards Asia. He's wanting to redirect the focus of U.S. foreign policy towards Asia. At least that's how we're talking about it. Um, there hasn't really been much pushback on that 
from Republican circles as far as I can tell, right? I mean, this is a major strategic shift, um, and yet Romney's response, and he had this uh, big anti-China thing a couple weeks ago, seems to be not so much that this is the wrong idea, but it's simply not being done aggressively enough or fast enough. Um, and so this is what we call the Asia pivot and the, and the, the, the shift um, of U.S. military and security and diplomatic attention towards Asia. Um, I guess starting with the Romney campaign and the GP foreign policy establishment, how is this going to play out in the campaign, or is it going to play out in the campaign at all? Um, and then beyond the campaign, right? I mean, is, is Asia policy kind of going to look the same whether we have Romney or Obama, and is that a good or a bad thing? Well, Feel free to wax eloquent. Sure, I'll try to be eloquent. Um, no, I think that the, the pivot thus far and probably for the rest of the campaign is going to serve as a useful uh, uh, justification for Romney's arguments about uh, how Obama's uh, defense cuts allegedly hollowing out the military. And he's used this uh, point and rolled it out and said, you know, the, the Navy is smaller than it's been since, I forget what he's in, 1914. I mean, he has some ship count uh, that he goes back in history and says, you know, it's going to be smaller than it was, you know, well before either of us were born. Um, and I think that's really how, the, how it's been used in the campaign. He hasn't, so essentially what he says is the pivot uh, or, or doing more in Asia is sound, but it's been under-resourced and that it's because Obama is trying to gut the military and throw our men and women in uniform out on the street, et cetera, et cetera. But what's interesting is that he doesn't see trade-offs. And I think, quite frankly, President Obama doesn't see trade-offs. I mean, they rolled out this pivot to Asia business quietly, privately, over probably mm -hmm. starting a couple of years ago. And then publicly, I think it was at the end of um, end of last year, beginning of this, that they did it. Yeah, the Australia trip was a big deal. That's right. So they came out and they said, look, we're going to try to, you know, insofar as we can, get out of the Middle East business and, you know, focus on what I, as a more or less unreconstructed realist, uh, think is a sound view, which is if you're concerned about international politics and international security, you want to concern yourself with big, powerful states. Um, and if you're looking for big, powerful states, you probably ought to look at the Asia-Pacific region. And then within a matter of a few weeks, when the Obama, uh, I forget, they rolled out several documents from the Department of Defense surrounding the strategy review. But the first of those documents said not that we were going to pivot to the Asia-Pacific, but rather that there were going to be two areas of emphasis, the Asia-Pacific in the Middle East. So, uh, you know, I, I, Ken Pollock wrote a book a while ago called The Path Out of the Desert, you know, Future for America's Policy in the Middle East. And we're on a treadmill in the desert. I mean, neither party has shown any ability to even in any way diminish the emphasis, I think a, a tremendously disproportionate emphasis on the Middle East. Um, and so I think right. this there's no trade-offs mentality worked in the 1990s. It worked for a while in the aughts, and I don't think it's going to work uh, in the teens. I mean, I think that you know, depending on what your assumptions are about China, the future of Chinese economic growth, um, we're going to have to start choosing. You know, the old Kennedy line about to govern is to choose. Well, for most countries at most times, to do foreign policy is to choose too. So I think this is a real problem for the United States. And you know, as you mentioned, Romney had the piece in the Wall Street Journal really needling the Chinese. And I thought this was a weird thing because certainly the business community has gotten less sanguine about China uh, over the last years, but it still doesn't want this sort of saber-rattling, uh, you know, label them a currency manipulator on day one uh, attitude that Romney had. So I, politically, I didn't quite understand what he was trying to do with that piece, but I think we're really, you know, on both sides of the aisle in Washington, stuck in this mindset that there are no trade-offs, we can be all things to all people at all times, and that I think belies this idea that we're going to pivot to Asia, right? A pivot means you move from one position to the other with a little twirl or whirly gig. And, uh, you know, you, if you stay in the place that you started, you didn't pivot. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because I, I wrote a little piece about this a while ago, and the you're right about the business community. They're, they're a little bit less than one, but, I mean, the, the Club for Growth, um, is, is really pretty clear on relations with China, that good relations with China are pretty important for um, 
for U.S. business. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, again, is pretty clear that um, this is really, you know, that, that, that U.S. business depends on a good relationship with China, and so much U.S. business depends on a good relationship with China. Um, and it's interesting that um, John Huntsman, who threw his support behind Romney after he dropped out after after he ran for president for some reason that nobody understood, but then he dropped out after, out after New Hampshire. Um, I mean, Huntsman really pushed back on 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 Romney, and so in in some sense, Hunts, Huntsman was was speaking for this constituency, this, this really important constituency of the Repo Republican Party that we know is big business, um, in terms of being more um, flexible with regards to China. I think it's also interesting, and I think you're you're quite right that this is you know a place where we finally have to choose. That I mean, really, for the first time since the fall of the Soviet Union, you can look in the next ten years and you can think about military relations and the military balance between China and the United States not being equal. Certainly, not that it was really ever all that equal to, with the Soviet Union, but um, you can think through a bunch of scenarios in which. I mean, China could really hold its own, right? China could prevent the United States from doing what it wants to do um, in a way that no country has been able to do since the Soviet Union fell in 1990, or in 1991 or whatever. Um, and that, I, as you suggest, I think really finally means that you have to make some choices, right? If you're going to focus on a really big, important country like China, or if you're going to focus on a, you know, a, a much smaller and, frankly, not nearly as important country like Iran, um, and that, that sort of making a decision between those two requires a decision. You know, you, in, there are some ways in which you can discuss Iran as a lesser included case of uh, preparation for um, deterring China or shaping Chinese uh, interests or so forth and, and so forth. But, you know, at, at some point there is going to be a conflict between preparation for continuing to manage uh, the politics of the Middle East and um, preparation for contesting the political um, outcomes in East Asia, that those are, are not things that we can do at the same time. Right. I think there's an important contradiction at the center of, you know, all U.S.-China policy, and I've been at pains to point this out um, to, to very little avail, right? But the administration, this administration, and I think it's been implicit uh, in prior administrations, has a trope about China that they use frequently, and that's that they say that they welcome a strong, prosperous, and responsible China. And I hear that, and I get really, really twitchy when I hear the word responsible, because it's doing an awful lot of work in that sentence. Um, because what you see is that the United States, through its policy of economic engagement, which has lifted tens if not hundreds of millions of people out of the worst abject poverty in China and given them a more decent standard of living, has also made China wealthier. And it's getting to the point where China's relative power gains are year on year greater. They're, they're narrowing the gap. Uh, between China and the United States. So on the one hand, America's economic engagement policy is helping to narrow the relative power gap between China and the United States. And at the same time, to my eye, in military terms, the United States wants China to act as if it's still relatively weak. And I think right. that is going to run aground at some point if we assume away, you know, a precipitous Chinese collapse or something. If I were China, right. I wouldn't feel comfortable with the United States owning my slocks all the way from my shores, or at least out past my literals, um, through to, you know, the Strait of Four Moves. And you talk, you talk about the String of Pearls, you could talk about, you know, a number of other Chinese naval innovations, but I think that there's been a real failure to grapple with this problem uh, in Washington, and, you know, I'd like to see more discussion of it, so maybe you have thoughts, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of interesting because we do have, we have a tool, the, the Navy has a tool for thinking about maritime military affairs in positive some terms, um, and that's the cooperative strategy, and the cooperative strategy I'm sure you're familiar with it, but not all of our, our not all of our viewers may be familiar. It's this idea of the thousand ship navy. This idea that there are certain maritime tasks um, that that need to be performed in order for the global economy to function appropriately. Not just the economy, but global society. Um, these tasks tasks include anti-piracy, disaster relief, um, the disciplining of rogue states, and so forth. You know that there are outlaws out there. These outlaws can hurt. Um, 
and this is, I think, primarily understood in commercial terms, but it can also be understood in political and social terms, that um, global naval power can produce a positive sum world for everyone. Um, and this is based on sort of some older concepts of hegemonic stability theory um, and so forth. But it's hegemonic stability theory with a, with a, with a multilateral tinge. Um, and one implication of that is that we don't necessarily need to think about every Chinese amphibious warship, warfare ship um, as a problem. Right? Sometimes a Chinese amphibious warfare ship um, warfare vessel might be a solution. Um, it might be a solution if there's another tsunami, or in, and there's a relief operations are necessary. Or might, it might be a solution if that Chinese amphibious ship is stopping Somali pirates, or if it's assisting, you know, even if you want to invade Somalia as a part of a multilateral action. Um, but I mean, and so that's that's a way that we have to approach. Chinese naval power, if we want to approach it in that way. Um, but there are two problems. I mean, I think first is we kind of lack the courage or our convictions in terms of pursuing that, because no one can really bring themselves to believe that a Chinese aircraft carrier is good for us. Um, and we lack courage or conviction for good reason, because it, is, it may literally be true that a Chinese aircraft carrier is not good for us, right? That there are also negative, um, negative some implications of growing Chinese naval power. Um, and yet we have, we are dealing with, with a situation where we are in tension and in a state of incoherence regarding um, how exactly we think about international cooperation, how exactly we define um, rogue and enemy and any sort of state which does not hold directly to um, the idea of um, a US-led global international order, which China has been com was comfortable with for, for quite a while after, um, after the end of the Cold War, but is clearly no longer fully comfortable with. And right now we have dueling vocabularies um, for thinking about the expansion of Chinese power. Um, and it's not clear to me that this election is being played out. I mean, I think that we have those dueling vocabularies on both sides. So I don't think that we're going to settle. This election is not being fought over how to think about the Chinese, about how, how to think about the expansion of Chinese power. Um, you have confusion and coherence on both sides um, with regards to how we should conceptualize the US role in East Asia, China's growing role in East Asia, and whether this is going to be fundamentally cooperative or conflictual. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I hear people, you know, talk uh, uh, about many of the things that you talked about. That you know, maybe the Chinese Navy can be useful in cooperating to deal with piracy or for humanitarian uh, interventions, like we saw after the tsunami. Uh, to my mind, and maybe I'm just mirror imaging here. I, I don't think much of what China is doing is about. Uh, dealing with piracy or humanitarian interventions. I think they're very squirrely about having their slocks owned by a foreign country who locked down another Asian country's slocks who shall remain nameless in the early 1940s. Uh, and they learned a very sharp lesson from that. And that's don't leave your slocks at the mercy of a foreign power. And if I were them, again, maybe I'm mirror imaging here, um, I'd be very nervous about that. And if I got the wherewithal to secure my own slocks, uh, I would try to do so, and I would try to do so in a furtive, subtle, uh, non-directly confrontational sort of way, uh, but I certainly would do it. So it's on those more, uh, uh, again, unreconstructed realist questions about, you know, who controls China's sea lanes that I think, the, you know, and it may be the case that, you know, Andy Marshall is running a, an operation in the Pentagon, you know, that, that's dealing with this in, in more candid terms. It probably is. Um, but at least in the public discussion, you just don't hear very much about how, what exactly responsible means in that strong, prosperous, and responsible formulation. No, I mean, I think, I think responsible means comfortable with a U.S. led global order. I mean, that, that's not what responsible really means, but I think. In the vocabulary we're using, that's exactly what responsible means, right? Comfortable with U.S. global leadership. And does a U.S. global order necessarily entail U.S. control of China sea lines of communication? Um, I think so, and I think that the justification for that would be that 
the sea lines of communication from major East Asian states should not be left to one particular major East Asian state. Right. And I'm not saying that's a sensible way to approach the question, but I think that that's how we're actually conceptualizing it. I think that if you were to ask people, I mean, they would say, or if you were to ask people in the Navy, that you would eventually be able to drill down to that. It would be that, you know, it's too much of a risk to leave all of this to the Chinese, right, when we have Japanese allies and South Korean allies. And we even depend on some of the same slugs, right, that we just don't trust the Chinese far enough um, to be able to responsibly maintain the U.S.-led global international order that we've established. And do you think that they should trust us? Oh, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely. I, I, I don't think it's at all irresponsible. I think it would be irresponsible if they did trust us. Right. Um, but, I mean, let me go back a second and... You were sort of suggesting, well, you know, this isn't about piracy and this isn't about relief. Um, I mean, there are some ways in which it is, right? I mean, the, the Chinese aren't fundamentally all that worried about pirates, right? They're, they deployed a task force to go out and fight piracy, not so much because they cared so much about the pirates, um, but because they wanted experience with long-term or long-range surface operations over an extended period of time. Right. Um, and if there's an earthquake or a tsunami or something like that in Indonesia and the Chinese show up and support, it won't necessarily be because of Chinese altruism, but it will be, you know, sometimes down to literally the question of they don't right now know how to conduct um, coordinated sea air ops, right? They, they don't know how to produce, put all their communications um, equipment together in the right way so that they could carry out uh, a, an advanced amphibious operation in the way that the United States can. Um, and so they're doing these things to learn, right? They're, they're doing these things. Um, for sort of very self-interested reasons, but that then have an incidental positive effect, right? That you know, they actually do occasionally catch a pirate and they deter other pirates. And if they engage in a relief op, you know, they're going to learn how to use the radios and how to make night uh, landings with their helicopters um, in bad weather. Um, but they're also going to engage very possibly in, in have positive effect on um, on uh, some disaster situation, um, some maritime disaster situation in Southeast Asia. Um, and so I don't think, and, and I, I think that falls within the concept of positive some maritime affairs, right? The positive some maritime affairs doesn't have to be altruistic, right? There can be a recognition um, that you know, countries are fundamentally doing things for their own interests and even potentially for their own competitive interests, while at the same time still performing tasks that are in the end positive sum. Yeah, um, no, I, I, think I, I saw some analysis. I saw some analysis somewhere that said, you know, one of the reasons we have more piracy is because the Soviet Navy disappeared. And the Soviet Navy had a Navy had a global presence. It was around all the time. It had lots of ships, and then it went away. Um, I don't know how accurate that is. At least an argument. I saw. But yeah. anyway. I, I think you're right, right, that a lot of these things are fungible across uh, 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 goals, right? I mean, you're right. Clearly, they, you know, they want, if nothing else, the prestige and the public diplomacy, like you say, if there's a big humanitarian catastrophe in Asia, uh, to show up with the Chinese flag flying and say, guys, we're here to help, like the United States did. Certainly, that's a win. And I think you're quite right that they want to be able to better coordinate joint uh, uh, air and naval operations, but uh, you know that a better ability to coordinate joint air and naval operations is itself fungible across potential policy goals. And if you go to the Navy and say, look, this is really great because it's going to give the Chinese a better op ability to operate joint uh, naval and air <laughs> operations, those guys are not going to see it as a strong, prosperous, and responsible thing. They're going to say this is increasing the risk uh, posed to my fleets operating inside whichever island chain you want to pick. So I, again, I don't want to be the full right. the full China hawk here, but I do think that there there's at least been a sort of failure to reckon with what a more powerful, more relatively powerful China will see as its interests, both you know in in near its shores and out to the first island chain or the second island chain, etc. Right. I mean, I. I I think that, and I, I wonder if you agree with, I, I, I suspect you probably agree with this, that um, a major problem is that the United States foreign policy has, certainly since 1945, not forever before that, but certainly since 1945, identified <coughs> U.S., the interests of the United States directly with the interests of the world, right? Um, and so any competitor with U.S. interests is against the world. Um, and that 
makes it very difficult to have a vocabulary, a, a more realist vocabulary, in which powerful countries have genuinely different attitudes about what outcomes should look like. Um, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. I mean, I think a lot of the the in international relations terms, the sort of liberal project has been to define a way zero-sum interactions in international politics, right? To say there's this order, the Chinese profit from it, they've gotten richer, et cetera, et cetera. Why wouldn't they be fabulously happy with the United States controlling their slocks? Because after all, we haven't shut them down before. And the realist answer is because we might, because they can't be certain about our future intentions. Um, and so I think this is, you know, there's the perennial realist complaint that's been aired uh, since time immemorial probably about realists being ignored uh, in Washington, and I think this is, you know, an instance of that where, look, you could say, you know, we don't want China to have greater uh, A2AD capabilities, we don't want it to, <laughs> to be able to control uh, its sort of green and blue waters at all, uh, but that, and, and again, those discussions may be being had in the bowels of the Pentagon, but I think in the policy community, certainly in the presidential campaign, uh, you don't hear an awful lot of discussion about that. All right, well, um, I think it's been a good conversation. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure, and hopefully uh, I won't alienate you or you, your viewers so much that I won't be invited back. Uh, if you have hate mail, then don't send it to Justin. We don't want to ruin his day. So just send it to me, and I'll, I'll forward it along. Um, all right, well, uh, this has been fantastic. Hopefully we can have you on again at some point. It was a pleasure, Rob. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks a lot.